Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Uh, John, we have a really special guest today. Well, very special guest to me because I happen, my wife and I happen to be avid readers of what I call mystery novels. Hmm. Uh, they're mostly detective mo novels and stuff like that. We've read all kinds of authors, but one of my favorite authors is J.A. Jantz. She's a New York Times best-selling author. This is a woman of our generation, Art, mm. and uh, she is writing, I don't know, close to two books a year. She's got four different characters or, or series of characters, um, and they're all different, and they're all fascinating. And they're just wonderful stories. If you like mystery and adventure and murder and mayhem and interesting characters, this is the author. This is the author for you. So um, her name is J.A. Jantz, and I want you to introduce her with a big drum roll. Do you have a drum roll? There? I don't do drum rolls anymore. <laughs> <laughs> J.A., how are you? Thank you for joining us. I'm just fine. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. It's our pleasure, believe me. People over 50, and those people are my people. <laughs> our people, our people. <laughs> our people, yeah. You know, you're a testament, of course, to that life doesn't end at uh, 50. Um, but I want to, before we get into your background and, and you, I want to talk about your newest novel. So as I understand it, you have written, oh, now I, I've written, I've read of your four series, I've read the Ali Reynolds series. Mm -hmm. I read the Beaumont series, uh, not entirely. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm following them. And the, uh, who am I missing? Allie Reynolds, oh, Joanna Brady. And there's a fourth one, the Walker family. I haven't read any of those. Well, the, the Walker family is based on, I spent five years of my life as a K through 12 librarian on the Tohono O'odham Reservation, west of Tucson. And I told 26 stories a week in K through six classrooms. And some of the stories I learned and told were the stories of the Tohono O'odham people. And so the, the Walker families have, the Walker family stories have those, many of those legends and stories woven into the background ah. of the plot. Wow. The, the first one of that is a book called Hour of the Hunter. And I think it's more of a thriller than it is a mystery. Uh, <clears throat> I, I always wanted to be a writer from the time I was in second grade and read The Wizard of Oz. I didn't want to be the wizard or Dorothy. I wanted to be Frank Baum, putting the words on the pages. <laughs> That's great. So when I won a scholarship to the University of Arizona because I wanted to be a writer, I signed up to be an English major. And in my junior year, I tried to enroll in the creative writing program in those upper division courses. And I, I was working in the English department 15 hours a week and the professor came in and I said, oh, I'd, I'd like to sign up for your class this year. And he looked me up and down and he said, you're a girl. And I said, so? <laughs> he said, Girls become teachers or nurses, boys become writers, and he wouldn't let me into his class. So in Hour of the Hunter, you will find that the main character, Diana Ladd, is a woman who's a teacher, but she always wanted to be a writer. Like me, she married a man who was allowed into the creative writing program that was closed to her. And the crazed killer, through some miracle, turns out to be a former professor of creative writing from the University of Arizona. That, that's called writerly revenge, and it really worked for me. <laughs> well, that's, so before we go to your backstory, which is fascinating, and I, I, uh, uh, there's so much about your background that I just absolutely love and what you've done and the challenges you face. Uh, but John, uh, uh, there's a new, as you say, there's a new book coming out. Why don't we take a look at that first? What's coming up? Right, it, it, uh, J.A., it's an Ali Reynolds book. Okay. Uh, well, We'll go back to Allie Reynolds. Actually, I grew up in Bisbee, Arizona, and the cover on this book is it's an Allie Reynolds book. The Joanna Brady books are set in and around Bisbee and in Cochise County, but these are set around Sedona. However, I love the cover on this book because it's the color of Bisbee blue turquoise. That's a strain of, 
of turquoise that yes. from Bisbee. So I love this. Uh, this is a book where you can tell the book by the cover, because if you notice, there are a pair of handcuffs, and one is open and one is closed, and that's the whole point. Ah. Back, back to my, my experience on the reservation, one of the hallmarks of Tohono Adam storytelling is that a story must end where it begins. So in this book, the first time we meet, meet a character named uh, Mateo Vega, we meet him as he is the day before he is being released from the Monroe Correctional Facility here in Western Washington. And so his story begins in the Monroe Correctional Facility and it ends in the Monroe Correctional Facility. Ah, fascinating. So you didn't need to go to that damn university to learn how to end a story. Yes, my writing school was on the reservation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's... That you have written, as I alluded to, you have written um, literally dozens of Excellent. novels on each of these main characters, these uh, uh, series. How many how many books have you written altogether? Well, it's it's somewhere between sixty or seventy. I can't quite keep it straight because when you, when you said we're going to talk about your latest novel, well, I have to do a mental handstand because. <laughs> This book was published the 1st of June, but since I finished writing it, I wrote the next Beaumont book, a book called Nothing to Lose that's due out in February of next year. And I'm 20% into the next Allie Reynolds book. So wow. it, I have to put my head back a year and a half, but I do, I do write about two books a year. I've been doing that since 2000 and I'm, I'm happy to do it. I, I still love writing. I write a blog every week on Friday, uh, which is sort of, when I was in college, I was only 100 miles from home, but my mother, who grew up as a farm girl in Northeastern South Dakota, my mother would write me a letter once a week, bringing me up to date on what was going on in, with my brothers and sisters and, and the people back home. And that blog I post every Friday morning on my website, jajans.com, is sort of my mother's weekly letter to my fans. It's a, a window on my life. A lot of times it's reminiscences of growing up in Bisbee. It's uh, being a member of a family where there were seven kids. And one of the reasons I think I can be a writer is that there were seven kids in our family, but I was essentially an older child because my two older sisters were six years and four years older than I was. Then there was that four years pa year pause. And then there was another four years after I was born before my next brother was born. And so all of the kids in the family are two years apart, except for me and I'm eight years up and down. Yeah. And what that did for me is it turned me into an observer because I was too young to play with the older kids and too old to play with the younger ones. And so I had to learn to entertain myself by reading, by watching people, by listening pe to people. And those are skills that are essential if you're going to become a writer because you have to have stuff to say. I, I spent 18 years of my life with a first husband who was allowed in a creative writing program that was closed to me. He never published anything. <sighs> he imitated Faulkner and Hemingway primarily by drinking too much and writing too little. He died of chronic alcoholism at age 42, a year wow. and a half after I divorced him. I, and I'll, I'll talk about that again in a moment, but in terms of being husband material, uh, my first husband was pretty much a dead loss. And my second husband said he was so bad that it's made Bill's life perfect. <laughs> 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 oh, 
But uh, from a mystery writer's point of view, my first husband was a gold mine because if I hadn't been married to him, would I have been hiding behind a tree in, in uh, oh, the name of the town has gone away. It's in northern, Mon and more northern Indiana, hiding behind a tree because a gunfight had broken out in my husband's favorite bar hangout. You know, you, you have to be married to sort of a, a bad guy to be able to have access to those kinds of live experiences. Um, when I started writing Beaumont in the early 80s, by the way, all of my books are still in print. So if you're what I call an IOR, an in-order reader, and you want to start at the beginning of a series, if you meet up with J.P. Beaumont in the first book, Until Proven Guilty, that book was written in the early 80s. And that's a lot of years ago, almost 40 years. And so those books are, the early Beaumonts are legitimately his, historical fiction now. <laughs> <laughs> because Beau is always walking through town looking for a payphone and, and trying to find a quarter. And somebody said, well, why doesn't he use his cell? And I said, look yeah. at the publication dates. <laughs> but, but when I started writing about Beaumont, he's written in the first person. He's a male homicide detective. Uh, and I, I couldn't have him working all the time. And, and so he, he had to have something to do with his hands. And so I had him do the kind of drinking that I had lived with for 18 years. And I didn't attach any particular importance to it. It was just sort of background stuff. And then when the fourth book came out, I was doing a book signing and a lady said, came up to me and she said, you know, Bo drinks every day. He has a drink of choice. Uh, it's starting to interfere with his work. Does J.P. Beaumont have a problem? And I said, these are books. <laughs> but six other people asked me the same question. And I finally realized that, that they were right. Beaumont did have a problem and it had been invisible to me. And so in book number seven, he has a blackout that he can't hide. And in book number eight, he's in treatment. Well, I'm writing Beaumont number 25 or 26 now. I'm not sure of the number. <laughs> And so he's been in recovery a lot longer than he was drinking. Now, I still have people who tell me they like Beaumont better when he was a drunk, and I worry about those folks. But I've also heard from people who have written to tell me that watching Beaumont struggle with alcohol was so realistic that it helped them with their issues. Yeah, I, I, I'm thinking that... Um... Uh, reading a lot of your backstory, that uh, inadvertently uh, is as much therapy for other people as it is for yourself. And maybe that wasn't the primary intent, but in fact, you are laying out all these experiences as part of the backstory of your, your characters, and I find that fascinating. But speaking of therapeutic, this is my book of poetry. I can't figure out how to get it. It's called After the Fire. And the interesting thing about this, I married Jerry Jans. Actually, his name was Jerry Jans, but it was spelled J-A-N-C. So it was mostly mispronounced Jank. So after, after he was gone, after he, he died a, a year and a half after I divorced him, um, the kids and I went to court and bought a vowel. We paid 400 bucks for that E on the end of our name <laughs> in 1983, so people would pronounce it right. But I started writing these poems, some of the poems in this, as early as 1969 and 70. So, and it's clear uh, what happened is my, when we married, my husband told me there's only going to be one writer in our family and I'm it. So I put my novel writing ambitions on hold 
and uh, but we were living on the off, just off of the reservation, 30 miles from town, two miles off the highway, seven miles to the nearest neighbor and or telephone. And so we'd come home from school, he'd be passed out by seven, seven thirty at night. And there I was all by myself. So I could sit at the dining room table and jot off these little pieces of poetry. And I thought I was being true to my art, but I knew I wasn't being true to him. So he never saw the poetry. I always hid it away in the, uh, the strong box after, after I finished each night. So we were married for 13 years. We went together for five years before that. And after he died, I had to go to the strong box and get out all of those documents you must present when somebody dies, the marriage certificate, the birth certificates, the, the divorce decree. And among those documents, there were all those pieces of poetry. And when I read through them, I could see that I wasn't being true to my art. I was being a writer and using words to deal with the central issues of my life. Yeah. And so the title poem in After the Fire goes like this. I have touched the fire. It burned, oh. but I knew I lived. It seared me, but it made me whole. He called me. I went gladly, though I saw the rocks go laughing through the singeing air. I have known the fire. I'll live with nothing rather than with less. The flame is out. There's nothing left but ash. And the people who write to me, having read this, when you're involved in a situation like this, you're married, but you're really alone. And you think you're the only person who was ever stupid enough to fall for all of those lies. And when people read this, when this book happens to land in the hands of someone who is in that situation, suddenly they realize that they aren't alone. And, and what the cards and letters I get about after the fire really touch me. Yeah, that's beautiful. I, you know, Jay, I, as, a, uh, as a, a fan, a reader of yours, uh, I'm always taken by the fact that your characters do develop. I, we started, my wife and I started picking up, I don't know which series it was, Beaumont or Ali Reynolds. And we must have bought one and liked it and bought another and bought another. And we didn't realize for, I don't know, half a dozen books or more um, that you had, that they were all still in print and that you had taken the characters and developed them book by book, that they actually changed, they grew. Because we started noticing, you know, we came in and Allie Reynolds was divorced, but she's not remarried. All of a sudden there's a book where she's remarried. Wait a minute, that must have been an earlier book. So we started uh, looking up, went to your website and looked up the order in which they were published. And we became, what do you call them? A readers, readers? I-O-Rs, in order, I-O-Rs, in order readers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we are mm -hmm. in order readers. And then there are S-E-Rs. Those are the sharp-eyed readers who send me all the typo problems. <laughs> <laughs> we're, not, we're not there yet. So I guess what I'm getting at, J.A., is that um, your characters, not every novelist does this, but your characters develop in sequence. So if I read one book and another book and another book, I'll see the development of the characters. Now, not only doesn't not every author do that, but I find that having started in the middle of your series, it almost didn't matter. It's a, it's a wonderful enhancement because I get to meet these characters and see their development, their story. But it doesn't matter to the individual books. We started in the middle and loved them. <laughs> and we can go backwards and forwards and, and still enjoy them. Uh, I'm, I'm rereading something because we're now starting to read in order. I'm now rereading a book that I read the first time before I knew there was an order to them. So anyway, congratulations, because I love the characters. And uh, they're all different. As you started talking about Beaumont, partly modeled on your husband who was an alcoholic, 
Um, Allie Reynolds uh, is a, a former newswoman who lives in Sedona. You, you lived in Arizona. I lived. I didn't live in Arizona, but in Sedona. But Sedona is one of my favorite places in the world. But Allie Reynolds has a lot in her background that is similar to mine, because when her life blew up in California, she had been a news anchor. She had been married to a, a network bigwig, and when her job and marriage both evaporate, she goes back home to pick up the pieces. When my marriage evaporated, I knew that if I stayed in Phoenix, I was going to, I was still susceptible to my husband. And if he asked me to take him back, I would. So I had to move to Seattle to reinvent myself. But that reinvention in middle age is something that Allie Reynolds and I have in common. But when I, when I was, I grew up reading John D. McDonald's Travis McGee books. Oh, of course. And Travis McGee, I loved him, but he never changed. Yes. He always, he always was the same guy. He always lived on the busted flush, and he'd meet some beautiful dame, and she'd do him wrong, <laughs> but the next book he'd fall for the next beautiful dame. He never yeah. learned anything. Right. When I wrote the first Beaumont book, I thought it was a standalone, and I was astonished when Avon Books bought it as a series. And then I had to figure out a way to go on. And I thought, well, I don't want Bo to be stuck in the Travis McGee time loop. And so I decided that I was going to let him age. And because I've been writing about him for 40 years, we're <laughs> a lot older than we were when we started out. <laughs> But I did the same with Joanna Brady. When in the first book, Desert Heat, she is married to a deputy sheriff who is running for sheriff. And when he is taken down by a cartel hitman in the first book, at the end of the book, at Andy's funeral, someone approaches Joanna Brady and says, well, how about if you run for office in his stead? And so in the second book, she is she is running for office. I, I thought she was going to be, when I started, I thought she would be an amateur sleuth, but it turns out I write police procedurals. And she'd be asking questions, and I'd say to her, you can't do that, you're not a cop. <laughs> so I had to change her into a cop. Uh, when she wins the election, people sort of think it's just a sympathy vote and and that she's not really a law enforcement officer but she goes to um, the police academy and goes undergoes the training so now in missing and endangered the latest joanna book she has now gone from being a single parent with one child to being a married parent with two children and she's in her third term of office as sheriff. So 12, 12 years have passed. Yeah. And so her daughter has grown up. We've seen Jenny go from being a, a smart little kid to being this self-possessed college student. Now, don't and, spoil it for me. Don't spoil it for me, because I haven't read that book yet. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Sorry. But well, I, one thing I, I would like to do, because I actually I'd like to, this to be a weekly series and just keep talking every week about <laughs> some of your experiences. But uh, for our Celebrating Act Two audience, if we could maybe shift the focus a little bit. Uh, you are an educated woman. You have a college degree. Uh, granted, you're not doing what you, uh, your heart wants you to do, which is be a writer. Uh, you get divorced. You go to a whole new area, uh, Seattle. And you, you're a librarian. I mean, you have a profession, and you have two little girls, and you become a. Uh, no, I had a son and a daughter. A, a son and a daughter. So you had uh, two children, yes. and you moved to Seattle, <laughs> and you become a uh, a salesperson. How did that happen? Well, I think it happened because I'm a very determined person. When I, when 
I was living in Seattle. I was a single parent. I had a full-time job selling life insurance. And, but I gave myself permission to write. And as a single parent, the only time I had to write was from four o'clock in the morning until seven o'clock in the morning when I got my kids up and dressed to go to school and got me dressed to go sell life insurance. And that's how I wrote my first three books. By, by getting up at that ungodly hour in the morning, my eyes would pop open at four o'clock and by four, 405 or 410, I'd be at my computer working. And so that's, that's how that happened. But in, when, when my husband died a year and a half after I divorced him, I was living here in Seattle. I was, and I was really, I was astonished by the grief I felt when he died. I thought I was sort of done with that. And the, and the guys at work, one, of the, one guy said to me at work one day, well, what are you upset about? You divorced the guy, didn't you? And so in 1985, my the book of poetry came out in, in October of 84. And in 1985, a woman who ran a grief support group asked me to come speak at a widowed retreat. And I thought I didn't have any right to be there because I was divorced when my husband died and all those other people were still married. So I, I didn't think I'd had my ticket punched. But when I got there, the person who took my registration said, if you feel like grieving, do it. And so I thought, all right, I'm here for the weekend. And on Saturday evening, when there was a, a grief support meeting, I went to it. And there were about 50 people seated in the room. And because I was nervous, I was next to the facilitator. And she, we were, the first thing we were supposed to do was say our name, our spouse's name, when they died and what they died of. And I said, my name was Judy. My husband's name was Jerry. He died of chronic alcoholism on New Year's Eve of 1982, 83. And about a, at 10 o'clock in that circular room um, was a guy who said his name was Bill. His wife's name was Lynn. She died of breast cancer on New Year's Eve of 1984, 85. And I thought, oh, we share that date in common. Well, then we were supposed to share. And I said, I had been on my own for five years. I was uh, raising my kids, writing my books, and making the best of a bad bargain. And then I waited to see what Mr. Ten O'Clock was going to say. And he said, nothing. Oh. So when the workshop was over, we were supposed to go outside to roast mar marshmallows. And I went looking for that guy with blood in my eye. And I, I walked up to him with his chip on my shoulder. And I said, so what are you, the strong, silent type? It was really a snotty question. And he looked at me and he said, no, it still hurts too much to talk about it. Within five minutes, I was literally crying on his shoulder. <laughs> I was thinking, oh, this is stupid, but it feels so good. <clears throat> and he was standing with one hand around my waist, trying to figure out where he should put his other hand, because we had both married the first people we ever dated. And we were about to marry the second people we ever dated. <laughs> because we, we met on the 21st of June. We got married on the 21st of December. And that's wow. seven years ago now. Mm. Oh. What a sweet story. So this is, you are the, uh, the, 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 the poster gal for celebrating Act Two and, and anybody who says whether they're 30 or 40 or 50, that they don't have another act in them, they should just take a look back about things that they hadn't done for whatever reasons and just get started because that's what you did. And, you, uh, and you're continuing on with just an amazing, an amazing story of uh, a wonderful act too. And all these new friends you have, all these characters that you invented and all the people that 
can see themselves and perhaps their life in there. I think it's just an astonishing story. And uh, I'm, I'm just absolutely uh, uh, delighted that uh, we've had this opportunity to, 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 when, to, to speak to you. When people write to me and say, well, I always wanted to be a writer, and is it too late for me to start? And I always write back and say, how old will you be if you don't start writing? <laughs> Good answer. Yeah. Good answer. And, and to resist and get past all those people who are negative, who say, no, you can't do it, or no, I won't help you, or you really have to invest in yourself, don't you? You have to believe in yourself. Yes, you have to, you have to ignore the naysayers. You just uh, sort of have to put them away in the background. That doesn't mean you have to forget about them, because it turns out if you write fiction, you may be able to use them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Writer's revenge. I love that. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to uh, the next Allie Reynolds book. Um, what, you held it up. What's it called with the, with the handcuffs? Uh, that's Unfinished Business. That's out now. And yeah. the Allie Reynolds book I'm writing right now is called Collateral Damage. Collateral Damage. Sounds good. And now, that, what that, that'll be out next year, uh, uh, 1922. 19, 1922. Yeah. Uh, Talk about getting old, Art. <laughs> right, 2022. <laughs> and that will be that will be in March of 1920 of 2022. Mm -hmm. Will be the 40th anniversary of the day I started writing novels. Well, I think oh, I, 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 I think that that's a great day for us to have you back, if not before, because. Uh, uh, there's, there'll be a lot to catch up in between. Yeah. And by the way, if people want to contact me, my email address is right there on my website. And there, I answer my own email. Uh, nobody goes through my email and sorts it to me. I'm, I'm always happy, delighted to hear from readers. Well, that's rare and wonderful. Uh, J.A., thank you so much for joining us and sharing your story and sharing some of your characters with us. I, I want to one, add one thing about your books, because we've talked about the characters. And of course, the characters are Im really important. Mm -hmm. That's why we follow them and buy the next book. But there's some wonderful stories. These, er, the characters get involved in murders and mayhem and uh, all kinds of stuff. And it, they're just wonderful stories. And they're they're. The fact that it's a series is only icing on the cake. And in each, in each book, I, yes, I write murder mysteries, but I try to find one moment of grace. Mm -hmm. One moment of grace. And, and the moment of grace in Unfinished Business is provided by the, a background character, by Ellie Reynolds' mother, Edie Larson. Mm. And so they're... My books are pretty much PG-13. There are a few bad words here and there. You know, for, for one thing, Beaumont worked for the Special Homicide Investigation Team, right. which is shorthand for that is shit. And so, <laughs> in all, all right. caps, there are occasional bad words, but, but there are things you can read along with your grandkids. Yeah. yeah. W wonderful books. And I'm about halfway through all of them. <laughs> so reading. We'll, we'll keep reading. And I'll keep writing. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. We look that. forward to seeing you again soon and to uh, seeing your new books. And uh, I'm uh, going to go out and uh, uh, get a copy of, the, uh, of your poetry because uh, 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 that, touches, that will touch me in a way, I'm sure, uh, that I haven't been in a while. Thank you. Thank you. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.